What's up, Eco Nerdlings? Welcome back. We're going to be discussing wind, biomass, geothermal, and different types of water resources, which are all renewable types of energy. So we want to be able to cool our houses naturally. And we can cool our houses naturally by super insulating them, taking advantage of natural breezes, shading them, and having light colored or green roofs, as well as using geothermal cooling. We can use wind energy, and the conversion that occurs whenever we're using wind energy is taking kinetic, which is the energy of motion, to electrical. The benefits of this are that it's pollution free, the source is free, and it's actually used in West Texas, Hawaii, California, and other places around the world. And the costs are that it can only be used in places that are, well, windy. So wind power is the world's most promising energy resource because it's abundant, it's inexhaustible, widely distributed, clean, cheap, and it emits no greenhouse gases. Much of the world's potential for wind power remains untapped. Capturing only about 20% of the wind energy at the world's best energy sites could actually meet all of the world's energy demands. So wind turbines can be used individually to produce electricity or we can have something that's called a wind farm, where we have lots of windmills. The United States actually once led the wind power industry. However, Europe is now the current leader in this rapidly growing business. The United States government lacked subsidies, tax breaks, and other financial incentives for people to actually get involved into the market of generating electricity using wind power. European companies, though, they actually manufacture 80% of the wind turbines sold in the global market. And the success has been aided by strong government subsidies to the people who are actually working on these wind farms. So here are a couple pictures of wind turbines actually out in nature in Texas. All right, so another type of renewable energy source is biomass. This is any type of organic matter that could be forest products, crop waste, animal waste, people waste, uh, anything like that that can be used to produce energy. And it's currently used for about 5% of the United States energy. The energy conversion that takes place is chemical to electrical or heat energy. And the benefits are that it's cheap, it has less toxic pollutants, and it's using wastes effectively. It's actually used in the Rio Grande Valley with the burning of sugarcane residue, and it also produces food, feed, and fiber. The costs are that we don't really have all the technology that we need to use this as well as we could, and it's not useful in every location, and there is some pollution that's associated with the use of biomass. So plant materials and animal wastes can be burned to provide heat or electrical, or they can actually be uh, changed into gaseous or liquid biofuels. So looking at the process up here, we have our, side, our solid biomass fuels such as wood logs and pellets or charcoal. Um, they can include agricultural waste, timbering waste, animal waste, basically animal poop, um, aquatic plants, and urban waste. So we can either utilize the energy by directly burning them, or we can convert them into gaseous or liquid biofuels. Gaseous biofuels include synthetic natural gas and wood gas. Liquid biofuels include ethanol, methanol, gasohol, and biodiesel. So the scarcity of wood fuel actually causes some people to make fuel briquettes using cow dung. So basically, they use cow poop to make little energy briquettes that they can burn. And it, this practice actually kind of deprives the soil of plant nutrients. So when those very same people need to go plant their crops, what would have normally fertilized their crops has now been taken out of the soil. So the soil is not as fertile as it used to be. And then in return, it can't really support as much plant life. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages to using those solid biomass fields? Well, we have a large potential supply in some areas, moderate costs, there's no net carbon dioxide increase if it's harvested and burned sustainably. A plantation can be located on a semi-arid land that's not needed for crops. The plantation can help restore degraded lands and it can make use of agricultural timber and urban waste. So 
some of the disadvantages are that it's non-renewable if it's harvested unsustainably and it's moderate to high environmental impact if it is harvested unsustainably. It can produce carbon dioxide emissions if it's burned unsustainably and it also has a low photosynthetic efficiency. It can cause soil erosion, water pollution, and loss of wildlife habitat. And the plantations could compete with cropland, and they're often burned in inefficient and polluting open fires and stoves. So biomass is kind of how you use it. If we use it properly, it can be very beneficial. If we don't use it properly, it can kind of cause more harm than good. So the next type of renewable resource we're going to discuss is water. The energy conversion that takes place here is kinetic to electrical or heat energy. The benefits are that we already have the technology to do this. It's pollution free. Dams are also useful as water sources and flood controls. And we have the world's largest source of electrical power. Costs are that it is environmentally costly to build new dams. And there are not rivers located everywhere. So this type of energy uses can't be used across the world in all places. So if you want to take a little bit of a closer look at it, you can read the James Bay Watershed Transfer Project in your books on page 304. So water flowing in rivers and streams can be trapped in reservoirs behind dams and released as needed to spin turbines and produce electricity. There's a little room expansion in the United States. Dams and reservoirs have been created on 98% of the sustainable rivers. Because there was not much room for expansion of building new dams in the United States in order to produce energy. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of large-scale hydropower? Well, it produces moderate to high net energy. It has about an 80% efficiency. It's a very large untapped potential. It's a low-cost energy. It has a very long lifespan. There's no carbon dioxide emissions during the operation in temperate areas, and it can provide flood control below the dam. It provides water for year-round irrigation of cropland, and it can be used as a reservoir for fishing and recreational use. Some of the disadvantages are that it has very high construction costs, and it has a high environmental impact from flooding land to form a reservoir. It can have high carbon dioxide emissions from biomass decay in the shallow tropical reservoirs, and we can have floods and natural areas behind the dams. And we can convert land habitat to the lake habitat. So we're basically changing the actual ecosystem. There is always a danger of the dam collapsing and flooding the areas, and that can uproot people. We can also decrease fish harvest below the dam and this also decreases the flow of natural fertilizer or silt to land that's below the dam as well. Next, we're going to discuss geothermal energy. This is heat from within the earth that is used to produce electricity. And geothermal energy is the only type of energy that doesn't come from the sun. The energy conversion that occurs is thermal to electrical and heat energy. The benefits of geothermal energy is that it's pollution free and it's actually used near Waco, Texas and in Iceland. The costs are that it's not available everywhere and we don't have all the technology to use it as efficiently as possible. So geothermal energy consists of heat stored in the soil and underground rocks and fluids in the Earth's mantle. We can actually use that geothermal energy stored in the Earth's mantle to heat and cool buildings as well as to produce electricity. A geothermal heat pump can be used to cool a house by exploiting the difference between the Earth's surface and the underground temperatures. So the house is heated in the winter by transferring heat from the ground into the house, and the process is reversed in the summer to help cool the house down. So these are some areas around the world that use geothermal heating and cooling. Next, we're going to discuss tidal power. The energy conversion that comes from tidal power is kinetic to electrical. The benefits are that it's pollution free, it's cheap, and it's renewable. The costs are that there's only two places in the United States that actually have tides that are large enough to do this. And we also have wave power, which is converting kinetic to electrical energy. Again, it's pollution free, cheap, 
and renewable. However, it's only sustainable in areas facing the open ocean, especially on the west coast of the continents, and it tends to be destroyed in storms. So we can also produce electrical energy from the water cycle. The ocean tides and waves, as well as temperature differences between the surface and bottom waters in tropical waters, are not expected to provide much of the world's electrical needs. There are only two large tidal energy dams that are located and currently operating. One is in Lorance, France, and the other is in Nova Scotia's Bay of Fundundi, where the tidal amplitude can be as high as 63 feet, or 16 meters. Well, I hope you learned a little bit about renewable energy resources. You can rewatch this video or others for AP Environmental Science on my website at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off for now. Stay nerdy till next time.